Okay, just a few words about uh, the latest events. <clears throat> this is Palm Sunday, and uh, you see uh, our Lord is humiliated and attacked in his three main um, aspects of his very being. Firstly, that Christ is God. Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ is God. That is called the, the, uh, the second person of the Trinity, assuming the human nature. What is that called? It has a big long word from the Greek, but it means simply the union of God with man in our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that called? That union. Hypostatic union, yes. By sanctifying grace, you don't have a hypostatic union. You don't have that, but you have what's called an adoptive sonship. When you live in the state of grace, you are an adopted son of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you, the Blessed Trinity, the life of grace lives in your soul. And that's what it means to live. To not live in the state of grace is, is to live in death and as an enemy of God. And so <clears throat> Christ is attacked in his divinity. Uh, when the high priest silenced everybody, remember he was the Pope of the Old Testament. Did Christ say, oh, you don't have the authority. I'm set of contest. You don't have any authority. No, he didn't say that. Christ acknowledged he was the high priest. And it was Caiaphas, and he was a wicked man. He did not have the faith. He lost the faith completely. But he was still high priest. And that reminds us today, you know, everybody's saying the Pope's not Pope. And you're in a dead end if you go that way. Sedeve Contism, although they have many uh, arguments that are persuasive, and they can back it up with maybe some authorities, <clears throat> but most authorities don't hold that. And they're not honest, the Sedeve Contis, in quoting many, like St. Robert Bellarmine, and they totally ignore John of St. Thomas, as Father Chazal brings out, who has been uh, in the Dominican priest in Avrier. John of St. Thomas says, even a pope who, who is a heretic, he's still pope. But what do you do? The church has to resist him. The church has to self-defense. Her, she's got to defend herself. You've got to defend the faith. And so the high priest Caiaphas said to Christ, I order you to tell us, and he's full, speaking as, with full authority, if you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you the one foretold? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christus, which means the anointed one? And all the Jews understood what that meant. That means the Messiah, the God who's foretold from Adam and Eve, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, Moses foretold, and Daniel. And our Lord answers, and of course, he being truth itself, he answers, Tu dixisti. You said it. And then he adds, and you will, moreover, you will see the Son of Man, that is himself, coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. And all the Jews, they knew the scriptures well. Does anybody know where that's from when, when Christ talks about coming on the clouds of heaven? Uh, Week, but where in the Old Testament is this actually prof prophesied? The book of Daniel. Daniel, chapter 7, yes. Daniel 7. Daniel speaks of the great Messiah, the Christus, coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty and fire ripping before his throne. And the millions and millions of angels with swords of fire escorting him. Something more powerful than you know, Obama arriving with all the, all the security and the, the guns in their hands and their berets. That's, that's a Girl Scout move compared to what is gonna, Christ the King will have on the Day of Judgment. So Christ refers to that. And all the Jews standing, they, they know exactly what this means. And they, because they have apostatized, they refuse Christ. It's hard to believe they could refuse him when some of them were cured by him. Some of the relatives were absolutely cured and maybe even brought back to life by him. But it shows the power of going with the flow. It shows the power of going with the mainstream. And look at Vatican II. How many bishops stood up against the mainstream collapse and revolution against Christ? 
against the Catholic tradition? Only two bishops. A lot of them at the council said, Archbishop Lefebvre, I'm with you. We're together. So he had 250 bishops with him that were going to do something about it. Did they do anything about it? <laughs> they went with the flow. Liberalism goes with the flow. So Christ was attacked. He was refused as God. And Vatican II re attacks Christ's divinity. And then they mock his kingship after he scourged. They crown him with thorns, genuflecting before him. That's why on Good Friday, traditionally, we don't genuflect for the prayer of the Jews because they use the genuflection to mock Christ. So it's omitted in the Good Friday uh, Mass of the Presanctified. And Christ is mocked as king, but he is king. He's king because through him all things were made. That gives him automatic domain. He's got copyright on everything in the whole universe. His trademark's on there. So Christ is king also uh, over us because he, by the cross, he conquered the devil. And by the blood applied to your souls, what two sacraments are sacraments of the dead that bring a soul from death back to life? More miraculous than raising someone physically from the dead. Baptism. Baptism and confession, where the blood of Christ really is a, brings life back to the soul by sanctifying grace. So Christ, uh, the king, he, he is king by conquest. He has conquered Satan. And if you're washed in his precious blood through baptism and, and repentance and uh, confession, the devil has no claim on you whatsoever. The only way the devil can have any claim on us is if we open the door and willingly consent to sin. And even then, the devil can lose grip if by repentance and sincere contrition. You come back to the sacred heart of Jesus. And God can infuse the state of grace, but you know you, you have the state of grace. You know you're forgiven in the Holy Sacrament of Confession. Outside, you're not sure. You hope. And that's why the, the soldiers before battle uh, or before any natural disaster, the priest will shout to everybody, make an act of contrition. Because if you die before you can receive the sacraments, you can still save your soul. And that's something you always want to remember. If you're ever on a plane going down, <laughs> you've got enough time to make the act of contrition. You want to speak, frequently repeat the act of contrition. That's called the spirit of compunction. It's not walking around gloomy all day. It's just knowing the fact that I have offended God, I have crucified him, I have, I have offended him by my sin, and to have that compunction, that, that kind of deep sorrow that you know you always have offended God, and that we must make reparation and carry our crosses peacefully and joyfully. So Christ is mocked as, as God, Christ is mocked as king, and Vatican II absolutely attacks his kingship. And this is, this is what's at the heart of the fight right now, dear faithful. And you little ones, don't think you're just, oh, this is all adult stuff. No way. This, you are in this fight. And there are little boys, how old are you, kid? Two. You're eight? <laughs> how old are you, Dominic? Seven. You're seven. Seven-year-old boy stood up to a a uh, Freemasonic soldier in Mexico. And the soldier said, take that banner off, which said, Viva Cristo Rey, Long Live Christ the King, because they had a big procession and rosary. And the soldiers came and shot at them and dispersed the crowds. And this seven-year-old uh, ran home, and the police followed him at home. And he knocked at the door, and he told the dad, tell your boy to take that off. It's forbidden by law. And the, the dad said, you know, hey, Jose, He's telling you to take that off. And little Jose said to his dad, Dad, you always told us we have to be ready to die for Christ the King. So the, the guard took his double barrel shotgun and pointed at him and said, Boy, take that off. It's the law. And little uh, Jose, I think his name is Jose or Juan, I forget which, he looked up the barrel and he said, Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King, which was the forbidden words, and blew his head off right in front of his family. 
right on the porch, his brains and everything. Brutal. Seven years old. So you little ones, you're in the fight here. And those guys were ready to die for the faith. And what we're seeing with Vatican II is a direct assault on Christ's kingship. They have uncrowned him. And this is what Archbishop Lefebvre always, always insisted. And this is why you men, you should get together once in a while and study these things, like other chapels do. The writings of Archbishop Lefebvre, of the popes, of, uh, of Hugh Aikens, the League of Christ the King. And I encourage that. Uh, but um, Archbishop Lefebvre said that is the key error of Va Vatican II. The, the religious liberty, which is a heresy condemned many, many times by the popes of tradition, and now was canonized at Vatican II, which shows you it's a, it's a council straight out of hell. And um, the fruits of it are hellish. And the fruits of it are removing the Catholic constitutions from Catholic countries. And Catholics and bishops and priests no longer promoting the social kingship of Christ. So you just <clears throat> praise modern democracy and go along, and we can be uh, we can be nice Catholics in our little our little cocoon, but never try to spread the social kingship of Christ to have a Catholic president, have a Catholic state, have the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary on the flag. This is what you Canadians got to work for. And. Uh, this was the great crime of Vatican II. And this is the great crime, <clears throat> and I speak objectively, because I, I don't know what's in the mind of Bishop Follet. God knows. <coughs> um, but he has signed on to the uncrowning of Christ the King. That's what he has done. By signing on to Vatican II, the Vatican II, he has accepted the hermeneutics of Pope Benedict XVI. That's why he loves Pope Benedict XVI now. Did you read his last letter in November? Praising Pope Benedict XVI as having prophetic wisdom and all this nonsense. This Benedict XVI was one of the engineers destroying the Catholic Church. He's one of the engineers dis dismantling all the traditional groups that are left. <clears throat> and he succeeded now with the SSPX. It's not will he succeed, he has succeeded. Monsignor Pozzo, after Bishop Four was, was uh, uh, consecrated last week, we were there. It was very beautiful. It was a tremendous event. Uh, the survival of the faith carries on. And Father Four is very much the spirit of Archbishop Lefebvre. And then Bishop Williamson. Uh, so now there's two bishops battling the whole world to keep the true Catholic faith and proclaim Christ as king. But... Uh, <clears throat> Monsignor Pozzo out of Rome came out saying, basically, everything's ready for the agreement. It's already signed. Everything's ready. It's just Bishop Follet has to prepare his own people and solve his own internal problems in the society. So Bishop Follet's challenge now is to seduce everybody to think that it's good to come under modernist Rome's authority. And he's been trying that with lies and deceptions. I don't like calling anyone a liar, but when you've got the evidence right in front of your face, it's... What else can you say? He has told people, I know, oh, there's no, nothing, no discussions, nothing going on with Rome, everything is dead, everything's over. And yet we learn from Monsignor Pozzo, he's saying, we've been meeting all along, and we still have more meetings. So who's fooling who? And so to sign on that, dec that trinal declaration, which is a, it accepts Vatican II, it accepts the new mass as legitimate, which is to accept it. It accepts canon law, the new one, full of heresy. It's very deadly. This is very serious because it compromises the holy Catholic faith. And what's wrong with Vatican II is it attacks Christ as God, uncrowns him as king. And the third, come down from the cross. The Pharisees around the cross and the scribes and all the, the Jews, you know, all a lot of them were possessed by the devil, says Anne Catherine Emmerich, because the devils, all of hell was emptied around Good Friday on Mount, Go, on, uh, Mount Calvary. They were all there, all of hell, unleashing their vengeance and their venom on Christ the King. So they shout, come down from the cross. If you're truly God, come down and then we'll believe you as if raising the Lazarus four days dead, stinking and rotting, didn't convince them. 
as if raising the daughter of Jairus from the dead didn't convince them, as if emptying the hospitals and nursing homes didn't convince them, as if emptying the leper colonies, curing them all, didn't convince them. Come down from the cross. Stop being a priest. Stop being the priest and victim on the altar of the cross. Come and, come and join us for a community meal. We don't want your cross and your sacrifice and your victimhood. That's the Tridentine Mass. That's the real Mass. That's what Mass is. Calvary made present. And that's why we adore him on the cross. That's why we Catholics always make, many times a day, the sign of the cross. It is our victory. It is our triumph over the, the devil, the flesh, and the world. And when the, when the priest drives out devils, it's always the sign of the cross. And when he drives out devils out of people, he holds them, makes them kiss the crucifix. The devil hates Jesus on the cross. And that's the new mass attacks Christ's priesthood, attacks the real presence, attacks the sacrificial nature of the mass, and attacks the very priesthood itself. Because Pope Paul VI uh, and uh, Banini, Cardinal Banini, the Freemason, define the priest as the president of the assembly. If that's not what the priest is, I'm wasting my time. So does the Catholic Pope compromise the Catholic faith? Can he? Yes. And he is. This Pope is. So what do you do? St. Robert Bellarmine says you got to self-defense. you got to oppose him publicly, and certainly the priests and bishops do, and pray for his conversion and resist him and hold on to the faith until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. And this is what Pope, or excuse me, Archbishop Lefebvre told the four bishops. Don't make any agreements with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition and we have a perfect, perfectly Catholic Pope, he said. When this will come, God knows. But we know it will come. Christ won't abandon his church. We're not Quakers. We're Catholic. Uh, Peter, you are rock. And on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. So we have full happiness and confidence. We're going to win. But the thing is, we must not compromise Christ as God, as king, and as priest. And that's what the gravity of what has happened with Bishop Filet in the Society of St. Pius X. Now, <coughs> excuse me. There is a great quote from uh, a French Freemason. Ferdinand Boisson. He said, a school, or basically anybody, cannot remain neutral between the syllabus of errors and the declaration of the rights of man. We can't be neutral. You've got to pick or choose, every one of us. Do I stay with the syllabus of errors of Pius IX infallibly proclaimed, condemning all the modern errors and, and condemning Vatican II and Bishop Follet is compromising? Or do I stand with the declaration of rights of man? and Vatican II, and uh, modernism. we got to all take a choice here. And every Society of St. Pius X parishioner, every Society of St. Pius X priest, as Sister Lucia said, all of us are going to have to make a choice. Do I go with the Declaration of the Rights of Man, modernism, Vatican II, the doctrinal declaration of Bishop Follet? Do I go with that and betray Christ as king and God and priest? Or do I stay Catholic? And stay on the side of the syllabus of errors of Pius IX, Paschendi of St. Pius X, that condemned modernism, Catholic tradition, and the, the position of the Marian Corps, SSPX Marian Corps of the Resistance, whatever you want to call. Uh, we, we have to make a choice. And what's happening is, in the Society of St. Pius X, uh, the Bishop Follet really believes there is no difference between the conciliar church and the Catholic church. He says it's the same visible thing, and since we're out of it, we have to come into it. And the Archbishop never said that, and we always understood. We're not outside the Catholic Church. We're not schismatic. We profess the faith. Who are the ones that are schismatic and outside the Church? Are those who, who, who go with modernism and side with the errors condemned by the syllabus? <clears throat> so listen to the words of Archbishop Lefebvre. The Church is occupied by this counter-Church that we well know and that the popes know perfectly and that the popes of tradition have condemned for centuries. 
They've condemned all these errors before. It will soon be four centuries that the church has not ceased to condemn the counter-church, which began by and developed along with Protestantism, and which is at the origin of all the modern errors, destroying every philosophy and inducing us into all the errors that we know and which the popes have condemned, liberalism, socialism, communism, modernism, Sionism. And as you know, what's behind communism is absolute Judaism. Every one of those Bolsheviks in Russia was a Jew. And they were funded by the Jews in Wall Street. Don't be deceived. Our Lady of Fatima knew the enemy. Actually, Father, they, yeah. in the 1901 Jewish encyclopedia, they called themselves socialists back then. Yeah. And they're at the root of this. And, and what's at the root of Judaism is denying Christ as God. That's why they're behind Vatican II, because they remove Christ's kingship and his divinity. We are dying from all this. The popes did everything in order to condemn these errors. And behold, the men who are now on the seats of those who condemned these errors and who are now in agreement with liberalism and ecumenism. We cannot accept this program. Archbishop Lefebvre, we cannot accept this program. And Bishop Four and Bishop Williamson are of the same, thank God, mentality. We cannot compromise in any way the faith. And the more things clear up, the more we see that this program, that all these errors have been elaborated in Masonic lodges, Archbishop of Fest. And speaking of Freemasons, <coughs> uh, remember these great these words. Uh, in 1820, Pius IX and Pope Gregory the Sixteenth wanted these made public to the world. This is the Masonic Lodge. That for which we must ask and seek and await as the Jews wait for the Messiah is a Pope according to our needs. This is the Freemason speaking. You want to establish that the clergy marches under your banner while thinking that he marches under that of the apostles. In other words, as they say elsewhere, through obedience, through obedience, we will, we will get the clergy to march under the Masonic ideas. That's what's happening. Obedience, obedience, obedience. You will have preached a revolution in Tiara and in Cope, walking with the cross and the banner, an almost effortless revolution setting the four ends of the world on fire. So their dream of the enemies of Christ is to have a pope who will promote their ideas. And we not only have one, we've got all of them, John XXIII, Paul VI, uh, well, Pope John Paul I, John Paul I didn't have much of a chance. He was mar murdered after 30 days uh, by the Masons in the, in the Vatican. So who knows what he was going to do. And then Pope John Paul II. But notice Pope John Paul II and Paul VI, are these mean guys? Uh, are they going to attack you and take a knife on you and rip your head off? Of course not. They're nice. They have big smiles. They're friendly. And Bishop Fillet is friendly. And Monsignor Pozzo has a nice smile. And Pope Francis has a great smile. And he can do thumbs up and uh, have, have a big youth day mass on the beach with all kinds of scandals going on and put a big, a big beach ball on the altar at St. P and wear a clown nose. Are these people mean? They're not mean. This is why it's so deceiving now, because everybody's nice. N-I-C-E-T-H. What <laughs> the hell was faith with good intentions? Yeah. Everybody's nice. Go to your local diocesan bishop. He's nice. Go to your local priest or having uh, altar girls on the altar and banjo masses and rock and roll masses. The They're all nice. But how are they heretics? That's the point. That's the point. If If... St. John himself says, if I come to you not holding the doctrine of Christ, don't, don't salute even those people. It says St. Saint John. Obviously, you can't be rude and all that. You want to win their conversion, pray for them and all of that stuff. But we got to realize the enemies of the church, destroying the church, taking many souls to hell, are all these nice, smiling people. And we got to realize, hey, wait a minute. Niceness is not going to get us to heaven. Right. 
I'm sorry? They don't listen. They're not listening. Can we ask God to punish them? <laughs> well, smite them out of order. Yeah, I mean, there is a prayer in the Litany of the Saints that, and many prayers throughout the, that ask God to uh, have revenge. The Psalms are full of it. May God revenge his enemies. And he will. He will. But this must happen. This time must come to pass to test your virtue, to test mine, to bring out the saints of these days. God is permitting it. God permitted the ten persecutions in Rome. If he didn't, we wouldn't have St. Agnes, St. Lucy, St. Cecilia, and all these great martyrs. We should only pray for our enemies because life is those who us. Yes, yeah, that, is, that is the right spirit. They don't know what they need. Right. God tempts them. I mean, sorry, the devil tempts them and uses them mm -hmm. to get to us. These yes. Are us to pray these are more highly educated men. They, are, they know what they're doing. They're more educated than we are, much more knowledge. Both sides. Right, but take some, take a real modernist like Pope John Paul II. He was really nice. He really was sincere, and this is why modernism is so deadly. You got you got a guy. You, you get all these clergy who really think modernists. They no longer believe Christ is God. The resurrection was a nice story. Adam and Eve was a nice myth. They've lost completely the faith, but they really think they're Catholic. This is the poison of modernism. So are they Catholic? Objectively speaking, no. And that's why they have to be opposed. But how is God going to judge them? God knows. But well, according to Canada law, they're no longer under power to do anything. Right. I mean, so the, the, the solution as individuals is to pray for their conversion, obviously. Pray for the sinner and hate the sin. But when you have these men in authority... You have to oppose them respectfully, like St. Paul stood up to St. Peter and St. Catherine to the Pope of, Pope of Avignon and told him, get back to Rome, and Archbishop Lefebvre to these modernist popes. We have to, to protect the faith. So... No. It's not. I just talked to a Saint, Society of St. Peter's Seminarian yesterday, and uh, we were in the airport. A good kid, pray for him, 25, and he's in his third year. And uh, But I told him, you're sitting on the fence. You have to, ex he, they go to Mass in their diocese. They've got a new Mass at 8 in the morning, a 10 o'clock Latin Mass, and then a 12 o'clock uh, Navasoto Mass. What's that? And I told him, you're, 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 what are you doing with the faith and with the mass playing this game? He said, well, we tread softly. And, uh, and then a bishop came. This was in Minneapolis airport. The bishop came by and uh, uh, you know, he kissed his ring. And I told the bishop, you know, your excellency, you know, your authority was given for the defense of the truth, not to destroy it. And uh, we talked about Pope Francis and all the scandals and the new mass and Vatican II and and, uh, and the St. Peter's Seminarian was at his Mass just a couple weeks ago. So they go to these Navasoto Bishops' Masses, and, Latin, and then they're Latin Masses. So what's wrong with it if it's the Latin Mass? The point is this. You can have all the valid Masses you want. You can go to the Greek Orthodox. You'll have a valid Mass. You can go to old novice or priests. Those are probably valid masses. But that's not the point. The point is, what's surrounding that mass? The modernism, the liberalism, the, in the case of the Orthodox, they don't have the faith. They refuse the primacy of Peter. They refuse the filioque. So they don't really have the faith. And the, but the mass is valid. And the Mass is even far more, it's very beautiful. It's an ancient Mass. They are a proof against the modernists that the, the ancient rite used another language and used ceremony and used everything to glorify the, the sacrifice of the Mass. So, in, in one sentence, you cannot attend priests who have uh, uh, compromised the Holy Catholic faith because you will catch their disease. You will catch it. You will catch that, oh, Vatican II is not so bad. Well, the new Mass, well, we can work with it. The, 
the St. Peter's Tridentine Mass, well, they're not allowed to preach against Vatican II in public. They're not allowed, and if they do, their heads will roll. Just like now in the SSPX, any priest who dares to criticize the doctrinal declaration, the supposed doctrinal declaration that's supposedly dead and Bishop Fillet won't use it anymore, but he has reaffirmed it to Father Pico and to another gentleman in Minnesota, it is, he, he totally supports it. The doctrinal declaration, which accepts Vatican II, New Mass, Religious Liberty, New Code of Canon Law, everything the Archbishop opposed, and every Catholic must oppose. So, uh, all that atmosphere is poison to your soul. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, don't go to St. Peter's Mass, because even though the Mass is valid, you're going to the sermons, the other people, the other families, the bookstore, everything's going to affect you. You know, well, all I can say is, you know, go to Mass as a priest that don't compromise the faith. I know that's getting slim. But I, what else can we do? It when can you, take to those priests that are in St. Peter's that they, that that society betrayed Archbishop Lefebvre. Are you saying a correct thing? Yeah, they did. Okay. But betraying Archbishop Lefebvre is not such a big deal as betraying our Lord and the Catholic faith and... The Archbishop himself wouldn't care. But the Archbishop said to them, they knew what the Archbishop said, and if they decided to turn away from that... Yeah, he warned them. Yeah. There's only a couple of them that left to begin with anyway, so they're still around. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, subjectively, I know there's, there's some very good priests in St. Peter's. They're, they have priestly hearts, they really pray, they love Our Lady, they pray the Rosary, they're zealous for souls, but... You know, this is why this time is so confusing. You got everybody smiling and everybody's nice. Even the Satanists are nice. That had their mass in Kansas City. Father, I've talked to Father McDonald over the summer. Or in Oklahoma City, sorry. Yes. He says we have to be careful and he says the priest there has a microphone wire speaker wired into his bedroom and breakfast room so he can listen to the sermon. If they say anything he disagrees with, he tells the bishop. <laughs> Uh, these are tough days, but so thank God that Bishop Williamson uh, did a brave and courageous act, which was to consecrate Bishop Four. Bishop Four, uh, he has several uh, already had several um, conferences and interviews. Let me just quote one thing from him. He said he lived through his family had to escape uh, from being massacred by the communists in Algeria. The country was betrayed by President de Gaulle of France. So that's one betrayal he lived through. And then he lived through Vatican II, second big betrayal. He says the third big betrayal I lived through was the general chapter of 2012 under Bishop Follet. Everything was staged and organized to sway everything towards the agreement with Rome. And he said that, he said he, now he has to speak out against this, this sabotage and betrayal of Bishop Follet. But here's what he says. This complete reversal was achieved with consummate skill by an unprecedented feat. Despite all the oaths, all the promises, all the guarantees, through a series of ambi ambiguities, ambiguous formulae, skillful and carefully staggered and gradual, constituting a Machiavellian deception without precedent, the general superior, the general superior general, managed to oppose a strong opposition through using relent relentless repression. Through using means, uh, numerous changes in the army and the civil service, he's talking about the betrayal that he saw in Algeria. And he also sent to death and to torture thousands of Europeans and tens of thousands of Harkis loyal to the French civilization. So in this drama, the favorite weapon of the devil for deceiving men, as always, is what? Take a guess. Obedience. Obedience is one of them for sure, but here he's talking about the forked tongue. What is that? 
double speak called well, the media does it continually, yes. <laughs> the media is a perfect example of it. Uh, ambiguity, ambiguous language, forked tongue. Like the Freemasons in Washington told Father DeSmet, oh, we'll take care of your Indians. We'll make sure you get Jesuit priests there. We'll make sure the missions go well. We won't kill the Indians. We won't sell them off to Protestant ministers. One side of the mouth, Freemasons. And then Father DeSmet would go back to the Indians. A whole U.S. cavalry would come and would just wipe them out. Catholic tribes, whole tribes of Catholic Indians wiped out by the Masonic White House. That's the other side of the tongue. Same with the Freemasons in Mexico. Make an agreement. The, the, uh, the Cristeros obeyed the Pope, Pius XI, who made a big mistake. They threw down their weapons. Did the Freemasons keep their side of the deal? No, they opened fire and shot them all. And Bishop Follet has lowered himself to use this means as well, ambiguous language. If you want the proof, just read the documents. Just read the document, especially the doctrinal declaration. It's a shame. Ambiguous formula is a f the favorite of the devil. Words with a double meaning. We can understand why in the scriptures the God of truth says, I hate a double tongue. Words with a double meaning. Os bilingue detestor. I detest the double tongue. And so Father Four shows how this is the means Bishop Follet has taken to steer the SSPX into this direction of modernist Rome. And as Monsignor Pozzo said, the deal's done. And they even got a name on it. They've already baptized it. What's it called, anybody? The personal <laughs> prelature. It's got a name already, even. <laughs> the thing is there. And so Monsignor Pozzo told the world, we just have to wait for Bishop Fillet to straighten out his own house. So I don't know um, how he handled that. But as you see, as you see, Manzingen now sided with Rome, modernist Rome, condemning the consecration of Bishop Four. Herod and Pilate are now friends. And now... Uh, Bishop Fillet is with modernist Rome condemning Catholic tradition. That's the picture. And it's all done again with a smile and everybody's nice and let's be friendly. But our Lord was nice too, but there were times he had to take the whip when it came to the honor of his father. And when he, he had to speak the truth to his own martyrdom. And he told his apostles, they will persecute you too. They're going to drive you out of the synagogues and out of the churches for my name's sake. And it was because we love our Lord that we are divisive. We are divisive. We are divisive against the ways of the world, the devil, modern democracy, modern politics, modern Supreme Court laws, permitting abortion, divorce, perverts. We are, we are divisive. We are Roman Catholic, and we stay with Christ. And to stay with him means, you know. But we can have a non Catholic Pope, right? Well, you, you touch a delicate question because he thinks he's Catholic. So did Pope John Paul II and Paul VI. Right, but their modernism is such that subjectively they really believe they're Catholic. They think they really believe Catholicism evolves. Do we really care then yeah. whether they think they're Catholic or they're not? Well, uh, I mean, God will judge them, but we have to judge what they say and do. And on that, we have to oppose them. So they're Pope. We pray for them as Pope. We pray for their conversion. But we cannot obey these men wrecking the faith. Whether they're dressed in white, purple, or, or, or um, red. So we can. I mean, you're still saying we can have a heretic. Uh, John of St. Thomas said you could have a Pope who's a heretic. Yeah. And he's still Pope. Just like our president in the U.S., Obama, the guy is so-and-so. And nobody likes him, but he's destroying the country. He's, he's selling us right into the New World Order. <coughs> and uh, But he's still president. And when Pope Francis dies, is he going to be judged as a priest? He, no, he's going to be judged as a pope. And when po when President Obama dies, or your president, or your, uh, what's it called, prime minister, prime minister. Prime minister. when they die, they're not going to be judged as Joe Layman. They're going to be judged as president and what they've done. So, so... You know, it's kind of like a mom or dad. A dad might become a drunkard, a drug dealer, and you know, run off and be in prison or whatever. But he's still your dad. 
doesn't stop being your dad. And that's kind of the same with Papa, the Pope. And that's why Pope Benedict, you know, he's, he's not this big traditional loving conservative. He's not. He is the first to introduce into the papacy a democratic term. It's very serious because collegiality attacks the primacy of Peter. So he resigns, and Pope Francis has already talked about his resignation. I understand the Illuminati gave him three more years. But they introduced this idea that the Pope papacy is like a presidency now. Very dangerous. Because the Pope is not a president. He is a what? He's got he is a mon... The big bad word to the modern Democrats? Monarch. monarch. The Pope is a monarchy. That's why he has the three crowns. And these modernists hate that. They hate it. That's why Vatican II attacked the primacy of Peter. That's why you and I... As long as Our Lady gives us grace to be faithful, are the, we are the biggest defenders of the papacy. The Archbishop Lefebvre was the biggest defender of the Roman papacy because he stood up against Vatican II, which tries to undermine the Roman papacy. So, Father, can we, a Catholic in a state of grace, fulfill our Sunday obligation by attending a society of, uh, of, the, um, of the Pius X Mass? Will you f fulfill your Sunday obligation? Uh, strictly speaking, you would, but you're putting yourself now, I mean, we've got to be honest and open here. The leader is leading them to the conciliar church. And that atmosphere is penetrating the SSPX. You ask the average kid in the SSPX high school, is the agreement with Rome a good thing? They're going to say, yes, it is. That's what they've been taught now. The whole attitude has been penetrating. The poison is in. And no longer the distinction between conciliar church and Catholic church. No longer attacking the scandals and of the modernist popes and the modernist clergy. They're all silent now on these things. And uh, the good guys are being punished. The bad guys are being elevated. And this whole thing, of you take, they can't attack Bishop Follet's modernism. They can't attack it. So that atmosphere is poisonous. So I will say it's dangerous to your faith now to go to those masses. It is, objectively speaking. Will you find some good priests in the Society of Pius X? Uh, yes, there are. And I know many of them who don't like what's going on. And I understand in France, well, let's hope this happens, but if Bishop Follet, when he signs the final papers, they say half the priests in France will leave. If they haven't left yet, I don't think they're going to move. They're going to they're gonna do like the crowds did on Good Friday. Most are just going to go with the flow. But pray for them, you know. If you go to that mass and they know that you're not in agreement with that and they say that you can't come back, is that a right? Can you, can you defy that and just keep going until they arrest you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what can well, they Well, it'll make you? parish life interesting. Um, I mean, if you go there and they say you can't come here, like they expel you, what, I mean, what right do they have to expel you from going in there? I know, but... Can they? Like, do they, can they actually call police and, and, and haul you away? Yeah. Well, it's been done in one, one mission yeah. in the U.S. There's actually a... But it was not just over the resistance. It was some, some misunderstandings of family problems, too, and a little bit more than that. But that's an abuse, obviously. Yeah, it's like a building. Anyone should be able to go into that building, but they can actually call police and, and, and get you to go out. Yeah, that's obviously an abuse. It's, it's an abuse, but the bottom line is we can't, we have to stay focused on what's essential. To adore and hold the faith of Christ as God, as King, as Eternal High Priest. That means hold fast your tradition, keep the Tridentine Mass, and don't budge. And anything that attacks it, we must never yeah. bite it, never shake hands with it, never dialogue with it, never compromise. And that's the fight. That's what it's about. Yes? Um, yeah. I've actually heard contradictory things of, of what Bishop Filet believes with regard to Vatican II. I've heard on a speech, although it was a couple years back in Father Pfeiffer, that he agreed with 95% of Vatican II, I think he knows the speech I'm mm -hmm. talking about. And then there's a view that he believes in the hermeneutic of continuity. Was it one or the other, or are they the same thing? 
Oh, hermeneutics of continuity will accept 95%. What does it mean, hermeneutics of continuity? That's a term coined by Pope Benedict XVI, which means interpreting Vatican II in the light of tradition. And Bishop Fillet totally accepts that now. And that's another, if I accept that, you better not come to my masses, you better not listen to me, because I've lost it. If I ever say that, I've lost it completely. If I ever say Vatican II can be interpreted in the light of tradition, I'm gone. I've become a modernist. It's a yeah. it's, you cannot mix the irreconcilable. You can't mix oil and water. You can't mix Christ and Satan and light you and darkness. You have to ask yourself who interprets the light of tradition. Right now, it would be Francis the Bruce. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah, well, I got to catch a plane. So I'll give you a blessing and keep the faith. And uh, try to read the recusant. The, the new one is quite good. And um, I'll give you a blessing. We'll say a prayer. <laughs> oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. And leave all souls to heaven, especially those that are most in need of mercy. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. St. Joseph. St. Benedict. Benedict said they omnipotenti. Pastors, if it is for the salvation of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.